Hey everyone, welcome to the ninth lecture in our series on imitation learning. I'm Sanjiban Chaudhary, a research scientist at Aurora and soon to be assistant professor at Cornell. Today, we'll finally look at imitation learning in its most fundamental form, as a game. This is a game between two players, a learner that generates a policy and an adversary that discriminates between the learner and human expert. We'll see how this simple game unifies all existing IL algorithms, as well as giving us brand new algorithms. Let me show you. If you've been following us on our lecture series, you might have noticed a recurring theme. For instance, in the previous lecture, we looked at imitation learning as distribution matching and ultimately reduced it to a game. In lecture six, we looked at two cost function learning algorithms and saw that both of them can be understood under the same game theoretic framework. In lecture 5, we looked at how reinforcement learning too could be seen as a game between two policies, each trying to do better than the other. And finally, going all the way back to lecture 3, we started by showing how imitation learning could be reduced to an online learning game. And today, I'll talk about our paper of moments and matching that presents a singular game theoretic framework it unifies all of these concepts. Our paper begins by posing a single fundamental question. In imitation learning, what do we ultimately care about? What is the objective function we should try to optimize? We argue what we care about is the value of the learned policy pi. Recall, that the value j of pi of a policy is the cumulative cost of executing that policy. So sum over t time steps and add up the costs of the state action pairs um, drawn from a distribution generated by the policy. We can then write our objective as the performance difference between the learner and the expert. So j of pi minus j of pi h and then minimizing this objective, searching over the space of policies pi. There's a strange twist to this optimization. The function j depends on the human's cost c, which is unknown to the learner. So if it's unknown, how do we optimize this function? Even if the cost is unknown, we can still claim to know the family of cost or value functions that the human may be considering. So we can then change our objective to consider the worst case policy difference among the class of value functions and then minimize that. In other words, this turns into a min-max game between a learner that's generating a policy pi and an adversary that's maximizing the value function. And the payoff is the value of the learner minus the value of the expert. Having defined this game, our goal is to reach an epsilon equilibrium of the game. In other words, we want to produce a policy pi star, such that for all possible value functions, it is within epsilon bound of the human policy pi h. Let's reflect on the statement for a second. This is essentially saying that it doesn't really matter what the human's cost function actually is. For any possible cost function they could ever pick, we would be within epsilon bound of that cost function. So this is truly a strong guarantee if achievable. As always, let's begin with an example to build some intuitions. We'll return to our favorite application of driving around a racetrack. So once again, you've hired your expert human race car driver to drive around a lap a few times. Um, and you wish to imitate their driving. This time we're going to solve the problem through a singular game theoretic framework. So min pi max j, j pi minus j pi h. An important choice in this framework is to carefully restrict the class of value functions for the learner to have a chance to imitate the expert. One such choice of value function could be don't go off the track. The way we would mathematically express this is to assign low values to state actions to stay on the track and then high values elsewhere. 
Quite simply, we could write this as an indicator function that checks whether a state does not belong to a track. So zero if the state belongs to the track and one elsewhere. A second and complementary choice of value function could be to minimize the lap time. This, this would quite simply count one for every state that doesn't cross the finish line. Okay, think of f1 and f2 as being two basis functions for the value function. Clearly, the expert implicitly has some weighting between these two value functions, but we don't know that weighting. As we'll see in our framework, we are going to hedge against all possible weights that the expert could assign to these two functions. Okay, let's proceed to play the game. So in round one, learner plays a policy pi one that decides to cut across the track midway through and reach the finish line in record-breaking time. The adversary looks at this policy and says, hmm, if I placed all my weight on F1 and no weight on F2, I could make the learner look really bad because it's cutting across, um, it's spending a lot of time off the track than the expert. As a result, the payoff function is very high because J pi gets a high value and J pi H gets a low value. So the adversary wins this round, clearly. Now let's proceed to round two of the game. This time, the learner is wiser. It chooses to play a policy pi 2 that this time stays completely on the track, although weaves around slightly, so maybe reaches the finish line a tad bit later than the expert. The adversary looks at this and decides to put all of the weight on the second function f2. That's the optimal thing it can do. Nevertheless, the payoff this time is actually pretty low because the cost incurred by the learner j pi is, uh, is not that much um, because the learner is not that far behind the expert in terms of lap time. And as a result, we have reached an epsilon equilibrium of the game. And uh, this is the policy that our algorithm would return. Okay, now that we've defined the game, there's really only one question left to answer. How do we solve the game? To answer this, I'll be telling you a tale, a tale of three moments. In all of imitation learning, this is perhaps the most important tale. Let's begin by talking about the first moment. We begin with the observation that we can always write j of pi as the sum of per time step costs. We can then take this expression and plug the same to our original game. So if you recall, the original game was min over pi, max over j, j pi minus j pi of h. We can then choose to expand uh, j of pi as sum over per time step costs. Similarly, we can choose to expand j pi h as sum over per time step costs on state action induced by pi of h. Right? So it becomes a difference of costs measured on trajectories generated by pi and pi h. So the game now becomes min over pi and max over per time step costs. And hence, this moment is appropriately named cost moments, where we're essentially matching costs over trajectories. Let's play this game on an example. So we have a race car driving on a racetrack. The human demonstrate driving trajectories as shown in blue. Let's say we begin with a random cost function, so the learner cuts across the track to get to the finish line. The adversary looks at this and now decides to bump up the cost of states that the expert doesn't visit, so states that are off the track. The learner looks at this and decides to now plan a trajectory that's minimum cost so that stays on the track as much as possible. And by repeating this process, the learner and adversary reaches an epsilon equilibrium where there's no cost function in the class of cost functions that the adversary could pick from that makes the learner look much worse um, than the expert. And as you recall, 
These class of methods are very, very familiar to the ones we looked in lecture six when we talked about max margin planning or maximum entropy, as well as lecture eight when we talked about um, reverse scale minimization uh, or IPMs rather. Let's now move to the second moment. For this, I want you to recall an important lemma we talked about in previous lectures, the performance difference lemma, or PDL for short. PDL tells us that the value of rolling out j pi h minus the value of rolling out pi can be seen as the sum over per time step differences in advantages where you roll out pi h up to a time and then roll out pi thereafter. And you can see this visually. So in other words, the performance difference is simply sum over q differences, which, where you're rolling in with the expert policy and rolling out with the learner. Now we're going to simply plug this result back into our original game. So our original game is min over pi max over j, j pi minus j pi h. Now notice that the PDL has the order in reverse. So we're going to take a negative sign and write this as j pi h minus j pi. So PDL tells us to roll in with pi of h. So state actions are drawn from pi of h and roll out with pi. So we're going to look at q pi. That indicates we're rolling out with pi. And we're going to look at differences between the actions chosen by the expert policy and the actions chosen by the learner policy. Now notice there's a negative sign on the outside. So what we'll do next is we'll take that negative sign and push it back in. And as a result, the order of the cues will get swapped. So we'll look at Q, the, learner, the action taken by the learner minus the action taken by the expert. Now the same problem remains. We don't actually know q pi. So once again, we'll have to pick q pi from a class of q pi's, which we denote as f of q pi. So we're going to replace q pi in this expression with this, with the, what the adversary would pick, which is q. So we appear to have a new game in front of us. So let's recap. The player one learner remains the same. Player two this time is the q function of the learner. The pair function is interesting. So we're looking at states visited by the experts. We're off policy. And it looks like we're solving a cost-sensitive classification problem where the cost of selecting the wrong action is controlled by the adversary Q. So this should seem very familiar to us. It looks like we're doing behavior cloning or a more sophisticated variant of behavior cloning. Uh, because behavior cloning was simply classification, and here we're doing cost-sensitive classification, where the costs of choosing the wrong action are penalized by adversary Q. Hence, this game is appropriately called off Q moments, where we are matching the actions of the expert off policy. So let's take a look at an example to understand what we get out of playing this game. We return to our race car example. Since we are off policy, we're going to ask the expert to provide us a demonstration. Consider picking a state in this demonstration that's sort of well in the middle of the track. So we have a state and we have the action chosen by the expert. Now intuitively, we know that it's okay to not exactly do what the expert did here. Right? We have some buffer room to make mistakes. This is elegantly captured in the class of Q functions that the adversary can pick from. No matter what Q the adversary picks, it'll always seem as if it's okay to make a few mistakes. In other words, pretty much all Q functions are fairly symmetric about the demonstrative expert action. Now let's pick a completely different state that's at the edge of the track. In this case, it's far more egregious to make errors on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. And we can actually capture this intuition in our class of Q functions that may measure 
something like, does an action get you off the track? And so all the actions on the right-hand side uh, would, would trigger that, that moment function. And so um, the learner would, the adversary would force the learner to try to choose among actions from the left. So you have get an asymmetric cue. And so even though off cue moment matching is in the same realm of behavior cloning, we can see it's a little bit more sophisticated. It's taking into account the consequence of making mistakes um, and, 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 and presumably leading to slightly better policies. And that brings us to the last and final moment, uh, moment three. So just as we did in the previous moment, let's once again look at the PDL. But this time, we're going to apply it in the reverse order. So we can write down the performance difference between pi and pi h, so j pi minus j pi h, um, as sum over per time step disadvantages. But this time, we are going to roll in the learner and roll out the expert. Right? So the difference can be written as sum over q difference, where we are rolling in the learner and rolling out the expert. So applying this PDL into the original games, so if you recall, the game was min over pi, max over j, j pi minus j pi h. So let's plug in uh, the result from PDL. So we're going to roll in the learner, so states visited by the learner policy, and we're going to roll out the expert. So we are looking at um, q pi h, and then this is simply the difference of the action selected by the learner minus the action selected by the expert. Once again, since we don't know what q pi h is, we would have to assume an adversary is selecting q's from a class of um, q functions. Um, f q pi h, so we are just going to replace q's uh, with, with the one the adversary picks. And we finally have a third game. So here the adversary is selecting q functions um, uh, that the expert could have. We are, the payoff is such that we are rolling in the learner. And this is once again a cost-sensitive classification, except it's on learner states. So this should look a lot like our old algorithms, dagger and aggravate, right? Where we rolled in the learner, ask the expert for an action, and then match that. And naturally, this is called on cue moments, where we are matching actions on policy. It's interesting to contrast this to off cue moments. And to see that, let's once again look at an example. So the game begins by, this time, the learner rolling out a policy pi. We then pick a state on this rollout and ask the expert what they would do. So the expert gives us a correction. Let's pick a state in the middle of the track. While the expert demonstration differs from what the learner did, our intuition tells us it's OK to deviate from what the expert did by a little bit um, because you know the learner can easily recover um, if, if they move off the track. And so this is really elegantly captured uh, by the sort of class of Q functions uh, because all such Qs in, in, in this class say that um, the deviation between the learner and expert is within epsilon, right? Now, if you look at a state that's on the edge of the track, it's really important that the learner um, does not error on the right-hand side of the expert demonstration. Right, And um, this is, again, elegantly captured by uh, the class of Q functions, all of which would heavily penalize uh, the learner if it were to error on the right-hand side of what the expert did. So it's really important for the learner to get this data point right. In some sense, this hints at the central tenet of all of these, all of these methods is that not all deviations from what the expert did is, are equal. Um, some deviations are more important than others. So that ends the tale of the three moments. Let's sort of summarize what we learned from the tale. We began with the imitation game, min over pi, max over j, j pi minus j pi h. We then showed how we can get three different games 
by considering three different moments. So the first moment we looked at is the cost moments, where we were matching entire trajectories um, between the learner and the expert. So to do so, we needed expert trajectories, we needed the ability to know the dynamics or a simulator, and we needed a planner that could minimize cost. And we show in our paper that methods like this get an O epsilon T performance bound, which is the best we could get. Second class of moments we considered are off cue moments, where we're matching expert actions off policy. Once again, for these uh, methods, we need expert trajectories and we need a cost sensitive classification oracle. Um, we show in our paper that all methods in this bucket get an O epsilon T square performance bound, so a quadratic error just like behavior cloning. Finally, the last class of moments are on cue moments where we match expert actions on policy. Here, we need an interactive expert, an expert we can query on policy, as well as the cost sensitive classification oracle. And we show that any method in this class can get O epsilon T performance bound, once again, the best performance bounds. Now, while it may appear that these are three very different games with different requirements from the expert and the learner, we show that we can reason about all three of these games in a single game theoretic framework, where um, the game is min over pi, max over f, and a payoff function that's both a function of pi and f, where the payoff function changes depending on which game you're playing. So this naturally leads to the next question, how do we solve this uh, game that we just wrote down? Now, because strong duality holds in this game, uh, we can solve it in two different forms, the primal form as well as the dual form. So in the primal form, um, the min and max orders are the same, so the outer player is the learner and the inner player is the adversary. Um, the, the learner is the same that we've been seeing so far. Here the adversary can either be a cost or a value function depending on which, which of the three games you're playing. Now to reach epsilon equilibrium, we apply a strategy for both players. The outer player, the learner, plays a no regret strategy, while the inner player the cost function or value function plays best response. So how would this look like as an algorithm? Well, it looks like a simple iterative algorithm with two steps. In the first step, the, um, the adversary solves for the best f given the current learner policy pi. Think of this as finding the maximally discriminative cost function or value function that separates pi from pi h. In the second step, the learner is going to take the series of f's and aggregate them, and then update pi to be best on the cumulative set of f, or use any no regret update. And what we showed in our paper is if you repeat steps one and two, you eventually find the epsilon equilibrium of the game. Now we can consider the dual version of the game where we exchange the min and max arguments. Um, so the adversary is now on the, the outer player, and the learner is now the inner player. And we can consider a similar strategy where the outer player plays no regret. This time, however, it's the adversary. And the inner player plays best response, the policy best, best response. So what would the algorithm look like? Well, same two steps. Number one, the learner solves for the best policy given the current F, so given the current cost or value function. Two, uh, ag the adversary aggregates all the policies pi and finds the f that maximally discriminates pi from pi h. So uses a no regret update. Now for most applications, we're interested in the primal form because it gives us a final policy pi that we can execute. But the dual form is useful when you're interested in finding a, a cost function or value function f, um, maybe for interpretability reasons. Um, and so that's what the dual form will get back to. Okay, so armed with this knowledge, we return back to our picture for the three different games that we were considering, and we end up getting three different algorithms. Now, full disclaimer, 100% of the credit for naming these algorithms goes to our co-author, Goku.
So for cost moments, our algorithm is ADRO, which is a dual variant. For off Q moment, it's ADVIL, which is a primal variant. And for on Q moments, it's DAQUIL, which is a primal variant as well. And if you want to play with the implementations of these algorithms yourself, I highly recommend checking out Gokul's GitHub repo. Finally, an exciting outcome of this paper is that we have, for the first time, a single framework that can capture almost all existing imitation learning algorithms known today. Moreover, our framework allows us to derive performance bounds for many of these algorithms that don't come with native performance bounds, as well as analyze performance bounds for future algorithms that are yet to be discovered. And with that, we are at an end. We argued that imitation learning can best be understood fundamentally as a game where a learner generates and an adversary discriminates. More concretely, it's a game between two players. Player one is the, the policy, and player two is a value function. And the payoff of the game is the value of the policy minus the value of the expert. In other words, the learner is trying to compete with the human expert on any possible value functions they may have. We went deeper and saw this game can have three variants. The first variant is to is cost moments to match the entire trajectory between the learner and the expert. The second variant are off cue moments where we where we match expert actions off policy, that is on expert states. And finally, uh, we have on cue moments where we match expert actions on policy, so on states visited by the learner. And finally, we ended up with a single game theoretic framework that's powerful enough to not only unify existing imitation learning algorithms, but give us performance bounds on new al potential algorithms that are yet to be discovered. On a closing note, I would like to reflect on some insights that we get from this framework that are yet to be explored. For example, the framework tells us something about the relationship between information and performance. It turns out that the more information we get from experts or from the MDP, the better the performance found, for example, O epsilon T. Perhaps this will be the basis for a wonderful future discussion, but till then, be well.